Good morning, church family. I hope you all are doing well today. Uh, Go ahead and find your seats, which most of you have. If you want to get a refill on your coffee, that's cool too. If you're new with us, I want to say a special welcome to you. My name is Philip. I'm an elder here at the Seed Church. We want to say a special welcome to those of you joining us online as well. We love you all. Uh, glad that God brought you all here today. Uh, have a few announcements before you before we go into worship. The first of which is next Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, which is kind of crazy that it already snuck up on us. Uh, we actually are having a baptism Sunday. We're having three baptisms. We haven't had a baptism since cool. we were at North High School in the pool. Um, I've been told we're having some sort of apparatus up here of sufficient size. Dunk um, a, dunk a dunk tank. So who's got the softballs? No. <laughs> no, we're super excited. We have three uh, individuals who want to profess publicly that they have accepted Christ, which is super, super exciting. Uh, so be sure to join us this next week for Baptism Sunday. Uh, if that's something that you, like, we can totally add more to that. If you um, hear this announcement and want to talk to either uh, Ryan, Evan, or I about it, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be glad to add you to the list or find another Sunday that might work uh, well as uh, for you to um, baptize uh, more people. So next announcement is uh, kind of our standard one. If you ha- haven't been receiving our weekly email and would like to sign up and get more information on a weekly basis about what's going on in the church, upcoming events, uh, the announcements we're talking about today, uh, you just go to the um, put in your email address. You literally only get one email a week um, just with uh, information to keep you up to date with the church. So with that, let me pray and we'll get into worship. Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the beautiful weather. I thank you for everyone here and the families represented. Father, we know that you have brought us all here for a reason and a purpose, and we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to gather uh, publicly and uh, praise your name and hear uh, from your word. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother. Good morning, everyone. If you want to stand with us, we're going to go ahead and get worship going. Uh, we're going to sing to our Heavenly Father. We're going to come sing uh, Restless Heart, Come Thou Fount. Chorus with me. Jesus, my rest, this heart finds rest in you. Jesus, my rest, this heart finds rest in you. One more time, mean that. Jesus, my rest, this heart finds rest in you. Jesus, my rest, this heart finds rest in you. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, and he to rescue me from danger, interpose his precious blood. Oh, his precious 
his blood oh oh to grace how great a debtor daily i am constrained to be let thy goodness like a better bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart lord take it seal it seal it for thy courts above here's my heart Good morning, church. Um, my name is Aubrey. If you don't know me, I'm a member here. And um, I was really struggling with what to share with you guys this week. Um, but the main thing um, has been I've just had a really rough couple of weeks, I guess, um, maybe months. I don't know. My husband can probably speak to that better than me. But um, so... <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think that each of us, as I'm kind of learning about Christ and growing, we, I will always have this one, like, core sin. So I have things that, that I struggle with that kind of come and go, but, like, there's one that has just stuck with me since I became a Christian, and for me, that's my anger. Um, and a lot of people who know me are like, you're really quiet. Like, why? That's not even a struggle, you know? Um, but as my husband can attest to, it's really bad sometimes. Um, and it kind of came to a head after I had our daughter, um, which can be pretty normal after you have a baby, but for me it was like level extra. So it was pretty bad. But um, so anyway, that's just what I've been deciding I'm going to fight. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I've been reading a lot and doing some different devotionals. And um, I think the last couple weeks I've just struggled more than normal because I have not been spending like any time in scripture. So um, I get up right before I have to be up. I don't get up early um, like I used to, and then, you know, I'm tired at night, so I just go to bed. So um, I've kind of been diving back into Scripture the last few days and picked up an old book um, that I've shared with you guys before, but I'm going to share an excerpt from it um, just to encourage you guys. So the book is called Shiny Things, Mothering on Purpose in a World of Distractions, and it was a dollar on Kindle for a while, so you might check if you like the excerpt. But um, it says, the thing is, I can't ignore my sin, nor do I want to diminish the amazing work Christ is doing in me because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his sacrifice at Calvary. For the cross changes everything, my past, my present, my future. It wrecks my pride, my selfishness, and my desire for gain and conquest. As I proclaim Jesus as Lord of my life and yearn to live in alignment with him, I begin to see the transformation the Holy Spirit is doing around me and in me. 
In the quietness, in the craziness, in the unexpected, with this soulful makeover, I begin to see myself as he sees me, a beautifully broken child of the king, bought with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb, the son of God. Through this glorious lens of grace, I am clean. I am a holy, beloved daughter, a legitimate heir to the throne. My salvation is firm and my way is set. So with that, if you would pray with me our confession. Father God, the power of the cross proclaims that we are loved. If you invite us right now, just as we are, the power of the resurrection proclaims that we can change. You invite us right now to become more like you. We confess that we don't trust your word enough. Bring your power into our lives today and root us in the good news of Jesus. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hill, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. And lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself. I belong to you, holy me. Lead me to the cross. As I tempted and tried, human, the Word became flesh, bore my sin and death. Now you're Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. And lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Holy me, lead me to your heart, lead me to your heart, lead me to your heart, lead me to your heart. Lord, I lay me down, rid me of myself, I belong to you, holy me. Lead me, lead me to the cross where your love poured out, bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Of myself, 
I belong to you, holy me, holy me to the cross. Our scripture this morning is Matthew 27, 22 through 23. Pilate asked them, what should I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all answered, crucify him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. Uh, would you guys pray with me, please? Um, dear Father, thank you for uh, this weekend. We thank you for the upcoming Easter and um uh, we just thank you for, Lord, just for your son and um, the work that he has done on the cross um, for us, the work that we could never do. Um, Lord, we just pray today that you would use uh, Ryan and um, just continue to teach us out of your word. We're just so grateful for um, him and um, for the work that you're doing. Uh, we are, We love you, Lord, and we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning, friends, members, guests. Take a seat. It is so good to be with you. I'm glad you've joined us, whether you're here or online. And, you know, before we jump in, I just want to take a moment to um, mark a point in time, but also to celebrate and just reinforce the culture that we have tried to build here and want to continue building here. So I was looking at the blog today of past messages and uh, March 22nd was the first Sunday that we were completely online last year, and uh, it's now March 28th of the next year, and I just want to say God has been faithful, and it's not always been easy, and there's been many things to work through and confess and repent of and struggles, but man, God's been faithful, and so it's good to say that. And then also, I want to encourage Aubrey and the band and Philip, and honestly, anyone who comes up and does corporate confession on Sunday morning, I just hope anytime a visitor comes to our church, and they're sort of like, okay, who's this person getting up here? And they're going to be like, hey, uh, I need Jesus in lots of ways, but he loves me and I'm working toward him. And everyone's like, wait a second, like this isn't a room full of tryhards. Uh, people coming together and, and only, you know, we don't want to be a church where we just always high-five each other for what we do well. Because when we do that, people that are struggling come in and say, Jesus isn't for me. I can't high-five people in my life right now. My life is messed up. And so when we do that shadow work and we lean into the gospel, people hear, oh wait, God's love is for me, right? And that's a culture that doesn't magically happen. It's a culture we all build together. And so many of you have helped us build that and continuing to build that. So Aubrey and the band and, and Philip and everyone else on different Sundays, man, thank you. Um, thank you for making this a space where we can safely say, all right, I can, I can let my hair down, unless you're me, you know. <laughs> all right. So uh, we're talking about the crucifixion today. Uh, because next week is Easter Sunday, so obviously we'll talk about the resurrection. We're going to have three baptisms, like Philip mentioned. If you've stepped into a relationship with Jesus and you have not done that yet, reach out. We'd love to put you uh, on the schedule for that. And so a sermon on the crucifixion, gosh, this is one of the major hearts of the Christian faith. What, is, what does a guy say in 35 or 40 minutes? It's not been said. Well, number one, nothing. It's all been said. But we got to focus on something so this doesn't just feel sort of vague and, and unhelpful. So here's the question I want to tee up for us this morning. Why in the world would people want to crucify a man like Jesus? That's the question. Just think for a moment with me about many of the well-known gospel stories, okay? So Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and gives two grieving sisters their brother back. Jesus goes out to lepers who are outcasts from society, touches them. They haven't had human touch in months or maybe years. He touches and heals them and brings them back in. 
Jesus goes out to prostitutes who are stuck in a cycle of abuse and oppression and frees them and hugs them and loves them. And Jesus talks to Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, and softens his heart and he gives half of his money away that he stole from people. And Jesus multiplies bread for the poor and on and on and on. And so maybe from the outside looking in, you're saying, okay, these Christians celebrate this, you know, Jesus being crucified. If he's so great, why are people wanting to kill him? And can you explain to me, like, if this is actually what he did, how is it possible that all of Jerusalem, as the Bible says, fist in the air, right, ready to drop the people's elbow on Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. How is that possible? Why do people want to kill Jesus? That's the question we're going to tee up. And so to get us going, I'd like to introduce you to a comedian you've probably never heard of. His name is Lenny Bruce. He has already passed away. He's a social critic and a comedian born in 1925. He was kind of ahead of his time because in 1964, he was actually indicted and convicted of obscenity. And so in today's world, a sign of a good comedian is someone who doesn't have to be obscene and is still funny, <laughs> Because that's hard to find today. It's like a comedian who's clean and can still be funny. Because so much of it is just, you know, like impulse, say something outlandish, you know? Well, that was Lenny Bruce's gig. And uh, by anyone's standards, he was a dude of, of pretty low moral character. And he just kind of went around and said offensive and outlandish things and made a career out of that. Now... In one of his bits, he says something about the cross. And his aim is to be like over the top and super offensive. But he probably didn't realize that what he was saying was completely true. And I want to share some of that bit with you because um, we live in the Midwest. And man, you go to someone's house, maybe there's a cross on their house. You go to the pool, some dude's you know, sporting a cross on his back shoulder, right? You come to church, it's up on this screen. You see it on a necklace, and you see it, and you see it, and you see it. And after a while, you maybe stop, you don't stop it and kind of go, what's this mean again? Uh, like, what, what, I'm uh, sure Jesus died on this thing, but like, what, what am I supposed to feel about this, right? Here's what Lenny Bruce said in one of his bits. If Jesus had been killed 20 years ago, Catholic school children would be wearing little electric chairs around their necks instead of crosses. And he's right. Can you imagine inviting friends to your house and they're looking at your decor and you've got a picture of an electric chair or better yet, a syringe with lethal injection written on it. And someone's like, what is that? And you say, oh yeah, the God I worship was executed. Now maybe you're thinking, that makes me feel kind of uncomfortable. Well, welcome to the early church. We worship Jesus Christ crucified on a cross. I mean, a cross was the epitome of like capital punishment in the Roman Empire. And these Christians are saying, we worship a man who was also God who was executed. Um, this is an interesting sermon because what we're trying to do is really understand what is it about the cross that both attracts us and repels us? Because it does both. When we really understand it, the cross is something that is initially offensive. But when the Holy Spirit begins to do work in someone's heart, even though there's still an offense there, suddenly an attraction develops. Not an attraction like I want to be crucified, but like there's something in this that I feel like I need. And I don't know why yet. And that's the power of the gospel working in someone's life. I could never prove this. Maybe nobody could. But perhaps all throughout history, the biggest reason why people have left Christianity is the crucifixion. Jesus even goes so far to say, right, that if you would want to know me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Now, we read that, and it feels maybe sentimental. But once again, in the spirit of Lenny Bruce, deny yourself, pick up your noose, and follow me. Deny yourself, sit in your electric chair and follow me. What? What does that even mean? Clearly what Jesus is saying is, hey, if you want to follow me, there are things in you that are going to have to be executed. There are certain ideas, ways that you feel, intuitions, habits, and ways of living that you're going to have to kill if you actually want to follow me, is what Jesus is saying. So, this morning, my goal is that we don't stay in just cultural religious sentiment, that we don't stay in a hallmark movie version of the cross, 
but we kind of go Saving Private Ryan style, right? Now, I'm not saying like we're going to get into the, you know, the, the details of what a crucifixion is. I just mean philosophically, intellectually, let's not cover this with pillows, right? Uh, so here's the three points for why in the world would people want to crucify Jesus. Number one, the claims of a king. Number two, a failure of politics. Number three, the need for blood. So the first passage is, uh, the first point is claims of a king. We're going to see that in verses 11 through 14. So follow along with me. Uh, Out of Matthew chapter 27, I'm sorry. Matthew 27, verses 11 through 14. Now Jesus stood before the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus answered, you say so. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, Don't you hear how much they are testifying against you? But he didn't answer him on even one charge so that the governor was quite amazed. Now, when I was in college, I developed quite a fondness for the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. In fact, enough of a fondness, maybe to weird level, that my oldest son's name is Connor Theodore McCoskey. And I thought, man, I would like my oldest son to embody being a dude who can talk intellectually on the East Coast and then go build a fort in North Dakota and, you know, kill a mountain lion with his bare hands or something. And um, I read a lot of uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt biographies in college and just loved it. And one story in particular really caught my attention that's just amazing. So on October 14th, 1912, Teddy Roosevelt was preparing for a political speech in Milwaukee. And a saloon keeper snaked his way through a crowd, yanked a pistol out of his jacket, and shot Roosevelt in the chest. But it just so happens, Teddy's speech manuscript had been folded up real tight and put in a shirt pocket, and the assassin shot right at the manuscript, which slowed the bullet down so much it only went a few inches in but didn't kill him. And then he proceeded to get on stage pull his jacket back, let the blood run, and famously said, you see, it takes more than one bullet to kill a bull moose. And gave a one-hour speech bleeding out of his chest. Now, I just want to say, if any of you aspire to politics and you want to show you can go the extra mile, do that. I mean, like, once that happens, it's like, this guy, he's got it in him to see this through, right? Pretty crazy. Now, that's a really interesting historical event. That's a true event, right? But whether or not that's actually true really makes no difference to my personal life. It's just an interesting historical tidbit. And in fact, there have been lots of great people in the past. We could go through lists and lists of great men and women of the past. But whether or not what they said about themselves is true really doesn't affect me. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. said a lot of things about himself in the world, right? But what he says about himself, what he said about himself, whether or not he was lying or telling the truth doesn't change my personal life. George Washington, Genghis Khan, you know, Madame Curie, we go on and on and on. But it doesn't work that way with Jesus, does it? There's something unique about Jesus that when we slow down and read the Gospels and process what he says about himself, man, if these things are true, it begins to poke into my personal life in maybe a pretty uncomfortable way. Let's illustrate this together and just look at three of Jesus' famous I am statements. And by the way, you know, the Bible, historically speaking, from historicity, it is the most historically verified ancient uh, work in world history. We have more full copies and extant fragments of ancient New Testament than any other Uh, ancient work by a huge amount. I'm not talking by a few copies. I mean thousands. And then we have the writings of Pliny the Younger and Josephus, the Jewish historian, who were contemporaries of Jesus and were writing about a man named Jesus causing a stir as extra biblical resources. So no real scholar today says maybe Jesus wasn't real or maybe Jesus wasn't like someone who caused an enormous storm in Palestine. Like this is all historically verified within the Bible and extra biblical sources, right? And so these are things that Jesus said about himself that the eyewitness accounts put down. Number one, just three of them. I am the bread of life. Number two, I am the light of the world. Number three, and the most offensive, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now let's just slow down and ask ourselves, what what do these mean? What is Jesus saying? 
So when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, read that in context. Here's what Jesus is saying. You need my wisdom and presence in your life so bad, you need me like food. MLKJ never said that about himself. Abraham Lincoln never said that. Harriet Tubman never said that. None of these great people ever said, you need me as much as you need your next meal. Second one, I am the light of the world. Not, not a light in the world, the light of the world. Which is to say, if you're leading your life and you think you're walking in wisdom, but you don't have a close relationship with Jesus, he's saying you're in darkness. If you don't know me, you're walking in the dark. That's kind of offensive. You can't say that to me, Jesus, unless he's God. But if he's not, get that guy out of here. What about I am the way, the truth, and the life? The next words out of Jesus' mouth in John chapter 14 is, no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is literally saying, if you don't know me, you cannot know God. Now that is pretty offensive in every culture, including ours. What are you talking about? This is the first point of why Jesus was crucified. Because he did all these wonderful things, but as people listened more and more to Jesus, they realized, I don't like what you're saying. I don't want to change my life. I don't want to need you. Uh, this whole thing that I have to kind of like grovel before you for help, I think I'd rather just silence you. Now, a quick note here on something cultural. When people hear this outside the church, I think it's very common for them to say, you know, and I understand it. If I was on the outside, I'd feel the same way. Like, these Christians are so narrow. They're so narrow. I mean, just like, I got to have Jesus, and he's the way, the truth, and the life. And it's like on and on and on. It's like, man, like, just widen the doors a little bit and don't feel so judgy. And what I want to do is, is if you want to critique Christianity, there's much better ways because this one really isn't logically sound. And let me tell you why. When, when uh, Ashley and I traveled to Ireland, you know, there's places where you're looking at a map or we could talk to a guide and they would say things like this. There's really only one way to get to this part of the island. I mean, I've lived here a long time. So you could go this way, you're going to get lost or whatever. You go this way, you know, you go off the cliffs of Moor and die. And, and you go this way. So you've got to go this way. Now, at that moment, here's what Ash and I could do. We could have said, unbelievable. You are so narrow. There's only one way to get there? Come on. You see, what I'm, what I'm trying to point out is, like, Christianity is not narrow. It is what it is. Either these things Jesus said is really true and then we have to slow down and ask some really hard questions, or they're not. If they're not true, Jesus is a con man. He's not a great moral teacher, like any of that stuff that maybe Jesus isn't the only way to God, and he's just a good teacher. Listen, good teachers don't pretend to be God. That's called crazy people. They need to be locked up. Really? So uh, it really isn't narrow. We just have to kind of decide is this man Jesus, does he have the authority, the consistency to say these things to me? And so that's reason number one why people will want to crucify Jesus. Number two was a failure of politics. Verses 15 to 23 in Matthew 27. At the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, what should I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? They all answered, crucify him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. 
Now, of course, Pilate's confused because he doesn't get the Jewish religion. And he's not followed Jesus. And he's saying, hey, guys, this is a poor dude who people have just told me he's healing people and loving the poor. Like, why do you want to kill him? And he doesn't understand that they're saying, no, 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 because if he's right, then we're wrong, and I don't want to change my life. So crucify him, right? That's what's going on here. And um, so as you can tell, Pontius Pilate is trying to keep Jesus from being crucified, but it's not because he's like super fond of Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus, right? It's two reasons. On the one hand, he wants to please his wife and, and keep a happy marriage, right? Right? We read right there that his wife sends a note to him on the judge's bench saying, have nothing to do with this righteous man. I just had a nightmare about this man. Have nothing to do with him. So on one hand, he's saying, okay, I don't want to displease my wife. She's obviously like had a serious nightmare and says, have nothing to do with him. On the other hand, he's trying to please all the Jews, specifically the religious leaders, because they're trying to stir up a cataclysmic riot. What they're saying is, if you don't crucify this Jesus, man, we're going to make your life bad. You better do what we say. And in ancient Roman world, there's lots of stories of governors. If they couldn't keep insurrections down, the Caesar's just like, behead them, time for a new governor. So Pilate's like, whoa, don't want to lose my post or my head. I, I want a people, please. So what does Pilate do? Well, he does what politicians do. He, he plays politics. And his plan is actually pretty good. Once a year, there was a custom of releasing a prisoner to the people. And Pilate thinks, I got a great idea. I will find the worst guy we have in jail. Notorious Barabbas. Now, this is before social media, right, or whatever. And he's notorious. So whatever this guy's done is so bad, Jerusalem knows about it. This guy is twisted. He's notoriously bad. And Pilate thinks, this will be great. I'll please my wife. I'll stop an insurrection because if I put Jesus up here in Barabbas, surely people will say, release Jesus and execute Barabbas. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? But he's wrong. And they say, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. This is really interesting. There's actually an irony here that we need to hear. And boy, this was good medicine for Matthew's culture. So Matthew was one of the 12 disciples. He was formerly a tax collector who was converted and started following Jesus. And he's one of the gospel writers who writes his eyewitness account of walking with Jesus. And he's meaning for his readers to understand something. Because Matthew was Jewish and he's talking to Jewish people at the time. But we have something to hear too. And that is the ancient Jews in Jesus' time were essentially trusting in politics. And let me show you how. They had the Old Testament, which talked about the coming of a great Messiah, a king, a leader, a redeemer. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll find that all over the place. In the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, uh, Daniel, it's all over. It's almost every Old Testament book. There's something about a prophecy of a coming Messiah. But the Jews imagined this to mean a leader who would wield economic, military, and political power. That's what they expected, and that's what they wanted. And so you'll notice when you read the Gospels at times, you'll think, why is it that all these people flock around Jesus, and then Jesus says something radically offensive, like, you must eat my flesh to live, and they're all like, you're wacko, I'm out of here, is because the Jews were hearing reports, there's a man on the scene who can heal, and they're going, this might be our Messiah. Oh boy, it's time to throw down those Roman jerks. This is it. He's going to brandish a sword. He's going to bring Israel back to be an economic powerhouse. If we can just get the right leaders in office, we're going to change the world. Just get the right leaders in place and the world's going to be a better place. We just need this Messiah to be here. And so now that he's up in chains next to Pilate, the Jews are saying, you're pathetic. We don't want you. Come on, if you're a real Messiah, throw a revolution. Get a sword, kill Pilate and the Romans, and let's put Israel back on the map. We need a military. We need power. We, we need these things to, to be redeemed. And so Jesus isn't about that at all. He's redeeming people from sin and death, not from Romans, not from some worldly power, right? And so here's the irony of this. 
Though the Jews are trusting in politics to make the world a better place, notice here, the power of politics isn't even enough to protect an innocent man and to condemn a guilty man. Pilate plays politics. Jesus gets crucified, Pilate gets out. And so just like a word to love on us, if you've ever been in the book of Daniel, something I noticed for the first time in my life recently, I've read Daniel several times, but when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get thrown in the fiery furnace, if you don't know that story, read the book of Daniel, right? You're like, what are you talking about, Ryan? I've just signed you up to read a book of the Bible. Go read it. You know what I'm talking about. So they get thrown in this fiery furnace, and God protects them. And when they come out, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, who's the greatest king over all the world at this point, the, the known world, he sees that these three men get saved. And here's the edict he gives. He says, if anybody in my kingdom disses the God of Abraham, Shad, uh, 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 Abraham, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thank you, sorry about that. If anyone disses the God of these men, they will be torn limb from limb. Now maybe you'd think, Wow, what a win. We have a God-fearer in office. What a win. If you don't listen to God, you're going to get torn limb from limb. Give it one generation, and it all goes away. And then it happens again under King Darius. And it happened under the Pharaoh with Joseph. And what's the Bible saying to us? You can't trust in this. You can't trust in politics like that. Sin is too deep. It doesn't work that way. And America's even crazier, right? Because you get four years or eight years. And it shifts and shifts and shifts and shifts. And I, sometimes as Christians, we get so tied up and, and we're biblically illiterate. We're not reading the Bible and seeing, listen, what if a president got up and said, if anyone disses Jesus, we'll tear you limb from limb. Sweet, we've got it. We're all gonna follow Jesus now. No, we're not. Give it a generation. It happens over and over and over and over in the Bible. And this is why when Jesus comes, his method is not a political platform. This is why Jesus doesn't raise people through. This is why Jesus says, if you want this world to change, I have to do deep work in your heart. And some of us going to be wonderful, but some of us going to hurt. But if you'll start following me, I'll teach you how to start doing deep work in other people's hearts. And we're going to start this culture of discipleship, of inviting people in to know Jesus, to be redeemed from their sin and brokenness and death and to follow him. And so the church stays faithful through all transitions of power. And we follow what Jesus says. I think that's a good, that's a word that Matthew's contemporaries needed to hear. Probably a word that we need to hear in the modern church to stay faithful and not trust in politics in that way. And number three, the need for blood. By the way, if you're listening, I get I'm making one point. So maybe you're saying, okay, but sub point, what about this? What about this? Hey, if you want to talk about that, I would love to chat about that. I really would. I'd love to sit and have some, some clear arguments there. That, that was not an uh, exhaustive discussion on that topic. It's just a way of saying what Matthew was clearly saying to his audience. Hey, gut check yourself before you get so tied up that politics are going to make the world a better place. The need for blood, uh, verses 24 to 26. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead... He took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. All the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. So Pilate says, I'm done with y'all. All right. Uh, mic drop. I'm washing my hands. They're clean. If you want to get rid of Jesus, it's on you. And what the people say is, let his blood be on us and our children. In other words, we will gladly be responsible for silencing this Jesus. Okay, that's what they say. Now, there is something so profound here. And Matthew is showing us something beautiful. You know, all of us have a need, all of us in a sense have a need for Jesus' blood. Because in this story, people are saying, we need to see Jesus' blood on our hands because then we know we've quieted him. I'm tired of hearing what he's saying. He can't tell me how to live. Get rid of this guy. But when someone starts becoming a Christian, 
Do you know what happens? They start sensing a need for Jesus' blood, but in a completely different way to cover their sin. I'm a believer in Jesus. And when I pray for my boys, you know what basically I pray? Oh, Jesus, let your blood be on me and my children. Let your blood cover us. Uh, Jesus even talks about this, right? Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. This is at the Last Supper. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. See, there's this like profound irony going on here where Matthew is actually saying, in the end, everyone will have Jesus' blood on them. The question is, in what sense is it on you? That's what he's saying. Because either we'll hear the claims of Jesus and we'll say, silence that. I don't want to hear that. That's offensive. I want to get away from that. I, I, I'm great with a Jesus if I can do Thomas Jefferson style and make my own Bible. You know, he did that, right? Jefferson, being a product of the Enlightenment, cut every miracle out of the Bible and put together his own special Bible and had a sweet little relationship with Jesus that he made up all on his own, right? Silence this fool, Jefferson. Silence this fool, I want my own Bible. Man, if we do that, we have Jesus' blood on us, but we have it like these people do. We're saying, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Or we begin to sense that there is something wrong with us. I don't mean something wrong with us to make us start deprecating ourselves, but we start saying, you know what? My problems are rooted psychologically and sociologically and culturally, and there's lots of ways to explain why there's problems in my life, but at the end of the day, I'm a moral agent and I'm responsible for what I say and what I do. And I have not always said what I should have and I have not done what I should have. And so I'm stained. I'm stained and I, I feel this need for it to be covered. That's how you know you're starting to become a Christian. You get to the end of yourself and the reason why there's problems in your life it's not only my parents, my struggles, my culture, my sociology, my psychology, but we start saying, it's me. It's me. And we start looking around and saying, hey, there's these other people that when they give their reasons, we say, whatever. You did it because you chose. But then when the dial gets on us, we're like, it's more complicated than that. It's my family. It's my background. It's my emotions. It's my trauma but you know you're becoming a Christian when you start sensing there's stains in my life that I can't get away by just trying to be optimistic. The Joel Osteen route is not cutting it. Oprah Winfrey does not give me sleep at night. I need someone who says, I will cover you. I will take responsibility for what you've done and fully forgive you. That's how you know someone's becoming a Christian. So as we're talking about the crucifixion today, here's what Jesus wants us to understand about himself. In each of our lives, we can either crown him or kill him, but we can't just be okay with him. And what I mean is that's not intellectually honest. A man who came up to me and said, Ryan, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You either know me or you will never have a relationship with God. I can't be okay with that. I can't say, cool, I, you know, I can jive with some of that. You know, that you're the light of the world and I'm, I'm always in darkness unless I follow you. That I need you so much in my life that I need you like my next meal. I can be okay with that. No, we can't be okay with that if we really think about it. We either crown him and we say, I need that bread, I need that light, and I need that way. Or we say, he's a con man, he's crazy, I'm done with this. You crown him or kill him, Jesus didn't make room in between. The church sometimes tries to make room in between because we want to put pillows around the cross and make this feel a lot more comfortable, but we can't. I mean, at the end of the day, we worship a man who called himself God who was executed. And that's why Paul, in the letter to the Corinthians, says the foolishness of the gospel. That Many people look at it and say, this is foolish. I really do believe, though. Man, I'm, I'm a thinker. I like to read. I've read about other world religions. I've spent 
since I've been turned to be, really gave my life to Jesus at about 15 years old, I have spent so much time studying what is it that's out there that I can believe in. I don't think there's any worldview or religion that is nearly as nuanced and appropriate and clear as Christianity to actually match my real life experience. You know? So what do we do now? I want to speak to three different audiences. Now, maybe all three of these audiences are in this room. Maybe not. But I know for a fact, every individual person in this room, you know people who fit in the three audiences I want to address. So let me speak to those three audiences uh, and then a final little word, and then we'll prepare ourselves for Easter. So audience number one, if you don't know what you believe about Jesus, which is okay, right? We want to be a church. We read in our confession. We can always come as we are. But as we come, we're called to change. So if this morning you're saying, honestly, I don't know what I believe about Jesus. Please read the four gospels. Slow down and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the first four Bibles or books of the Bible in the New Testament. Read them with an open mind. Because, like I said, from a historical scholarship standpoint, these are the most historically verified ancient documents in world history. So read them with an open mind and, and really take in what Jesus is saying and it's going to help you begin to, to figure out where do I stand with Jesus? Maybe you're thinking, Ryan, that's going to require time and whatever else and I have more important things to do. I get that. I get that feeling. Uh, I want to encourage you though. If you have close friends that you care about, parents you care about, kids that you care about, you know they're going to ask questions, right, at some point? And the church for too long has sort of done this like, well, mommy and daddy believe in Jesus, so you do too. That's not enough. Kids want to think. People want to think. They want to make sense. And if all we've got is just this is kind of the religious thing we do. Man, that's why the church hasn't really thrived in American culture. Because there hasn't been that real understanding of what, man, what do I believe about Jesus and why? So we got to do that. Second audience if you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, and hear this, I'm glad you're here this morning. I don't know if that's anyone here, but I'm glad you're here. I want this to be a church where people can come and kick the tires of Christianity and say, what's this bald guy gonna say? And who are these people? And is any of this real? You know, so if you're in that boat, man, I'm glad you're with us today. Welcome. Um, if you would say, I don't believe in this, I, I encourage you to honestly assess how you came to that conclusion. Someone that's helped me as a pastor for a long time is to talk to non-believers, whether on social media or in person. And not like, I'm going to proselytize you right now, but saying, hey, why don't you believe that? In almost every case in our culture, when someone says they're not a Christian, but they've looked into it, they've walked away from Jesus because to believe that was going to deeply affect something in their personal life. For example, uh, it was going to affect their relationships. It was going to affect their status among friends who thought Christianity was stupid. This is especially true in young, educated people who were like, hey, if I believe this, my friends are going to think I'm dumb. Like this, like, this is not what educated people think. Or it was going to bring family tension. My parents don't believe that. My siblings don't believe that. If I talk about that in my family, my family's not going to accept me or want to spend time with me. Or... Um, it was because of life goals. If I actually believe this, I can't live for what I'm living for right now. If I believe Jesus, you're telling me I have to like restructure my priorities. Use of money, understand, we could go on and on. Now here's what I want to say. If we, if a person walks away from Jesus for that reason, um, I think we have to ask ourselves, am I looking for truth or something that is philosophically comforting? Listen, newsflash, Christianity is not always going to comfort you. It's not. And then maybe you'd say, well, I'm going to poke a hole in it for that reason. But just think with me and be honest. Go deep and be honest. Is it in your experience that truth has always comforted you? When you learn something about yourself that you didn't know, because a relationship goes bad and you say, I'm a lot more of a coward than I thought I was. 
I'm, I'm a lot more of a, of a dealing with this problem. That's, that doesn't comfort me. When I find those truths out about myself, I'm like, I, I'd kind of like to just go listen to a song and pretend like I'm a great husband or a great dad. What if there's brokenness in a relationship? Does it comfort you to hear the truth about what's going on? See, like what, what I'm trying to process is I get why someone would walk away for that reason, but it doesn't really make sense. Because if Christianity is true, wouldn't we expect there are going to be parts of it that make you very, very uncomfortable that you'll have to wrestle with? And I remember first becoming a Christian and reading some things in the Old Testament and saying, I don't want to read that again. But over time, as I wrestled in it, I realized my frame of reference, everything I had learned from the culture had like clarified. And slowly as God started to strip those away, I'd go back and read that passage and be like, hmm, Maybe it is important that God is just. It doesn't just let people do whatever they want. Maybe there is something to this I haven't seen before, and I've been too quick to push away from it. So if you don't believe this, um, I just really encourage you to process, is it because it made you uncomfortable? Because listen, if it's true, parts of it are going to thrill you, and parts of it will make you very uncomfortable. So would you wrestle in it? Would you do that with us? Do you have any friends who maybe you'd say, man, it'd be helpful if they would process along this way. So maybe invite them to church or have coffee with them. You know, or encourage them to read the Bible and say, you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me. Third audience. Um, if you believe Jesus is the son of God. So you'd say, Ryan, I believe I believe. I want Jesus' blood to be on me and my children. I want to be forgiven. I want to be free. I believe. Well, if you believe, continue reading the Bible so you can always be differentiating the real Jesus from false cultural versions of Jesus. This is really important in our culture. Listen, depending on where you go in our culture, you will find conservative Republican Jesus and progressive liberal Jesus, okay? You will find feminist Jesus and you will find macho masculinity Jesus, you pick any sort of like bent or, or cause, you'll find a version of Jesus. And it's very simple. Just think about it. If there's something that you're really passionate about, and it's like the North Star in your life, you're like, this is what I'm passionate about. You'll use everything at your disposal to prove it. So if someone says, no matter what, I am a conservative, the answer is, I make Jesus fit in what I want. No matter what, I'm a liberal. I blinker out some things and accept other things from Jesus. No matter what, I believe in this, or I care about this, or I'm, if your deepest passion is anything but Jesus, you will always be taking parts off of Jesus to fit what you really want to believe. That's not surprising. It's always been this way. It's that way with other things in our life. I mean, if you want to believe something and someone says something you want to believe, you cut off some edges and make it fit, right? Um, so if you're a believer and you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, Ryan, keep reading your Bible because it's going to help you differentiate the real Jesus from the false one. Here's just a quick example. Very, very quick. But a lot of, a lot of uh, high-thinking scholarship Christians have noted this in our culture. The early church, from a social standpoint, was committed to four things through and through. They were pro-life. They believed sex only belonged in a marriage of one husband, one wife. They were radically generous to the poor and they taught that the gospel broke down all racial barriers and created racial equality. Now in our culture, those two were broken up in two political parties. And so if you're more committed to be conservative or liberal, you're tempted to highlight one part of Jesus and to delete the other, depending on what side of the line you fall. The early church didn't live in that space. There was an equal commitment to all four of those socially. Now, that's going to be hard to fight for in a culture like ours. Because listen, friends, if we decided we want to walk that road, you ain't making anybody happy. You ain't, I mean, nobody. You're going to look like an enemy to everyone. Everyone's like, why aren't you on our side? Why aren't you with us? That's what Jesus' disciples felt too. So if, you're, if you say, I am a Christian, Ryan, keep reading your Bible so you can differentiate what Jesus really taught and said from cultural versions of him. Um, 
And also, if you're saying you're a Christian, that means you've accepted the responsibility of helping other people know him and representing his character. Oh boy, that's a tall, that's a tall glass. When you don't represent his character, and I don't, I don't on a regular basis, I just don't. I can stay in the shoes of my sweet sister Aubrey and get up and say, hey, there's things. There's things that Jesus is always working on. So what do we do? We repent together. We repent and we follow him and we, we walk after him and we don't just say, hey, it's, it's my way and, and uh, you know, out with Jesus. And also, if we want to help other people know Jesus, boy, we cannot belittle other people who don't know him. We got to be careful not to belittle other people, but to really engage and listen and process. Okay, last little point about Jesus and then we'll close and, and move toward Easter. The focus today was why would people want to crucify Jesus? And we looked at that. Because the claims he made as a king, because of failure of politics and a need for blood. But here's the last question I'll ask with a very small answer. Why did Jesus choose this? Because the the Bible says that Jesus was not bamboozled or shanghaied. He chose to come. He chose to carry this cross. He chose to die. And he's God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has everything. Why in the world would he come do this? You know, the one thing he didn't have was you and me. That's the one thing Jesus didn't have was us. And that's why the prophecy in Isaiah 53 says that the the suffering servant, he suffers with joy because he knows he's accounting many as righteous which means by his life and death, he's making us righteous so we can be with him and have a relationship with him. God, Jesus had everything. He's God. He didn't just leave heaven to glorify the Father. He could have glorified the Father just fine in heaven. He came to carry that cross because he didn't have you. He loves you. He loves you. You need to hear that. So friends, this week as we approach Easter, all right, Next week, it is like religious holiday soup du jour, right? I mean, Easter and Christmas. It's like, even if you don't even know anything you believe, this is just kind of what Americans do, right? We we just, we go to these things. This week, slow down and maybe ask yourself a question, right? Why do I believe these things? Do I believe these things? What, What things don't sit well with me that I actually have some real objections I need to work through? Listen, friends, the church should be a great place to ask questions, and it needs to be. But hear me, please hear me. I've talked to a lot of young people who have said, man, I don't go to church because you can't ask questions there. But the more I dig, what I begin to understand is they're saying, I need a community where when I ask questions, I don't get uncomfortable answers, and everyone just agrees that, well, we probably don't know, so let's all just ask our questions. That's not Christianity. I mean, I can't find a place in the Bible where someone goes to Jesus or an apostle and says, how do I live my life? And they say, let's just keep asking questions together. There's there's no real clear answers. Let's just keep asking questions. I think a lot of young people are hungering for that. Like, I want to think this through, but we have to process, okay, we can think it through, but if you ask your question and there's like an answer that's clearly forming in the Bible, are we going to listen? So let's let's just be a place that we can ask questions, but we have to process through the lens of Scripture together. So, friends, I love you. So glad to be with you. I'm I'm passionate about people knowing Jesus, the real Jesus. And we got to be passionate about that together. And so next week, we're going to celebrate some baptisms, invite some friends to church. Man, we'll hang some chairs from the ceiling. Philip Zevenbergen's on that. He already said just zip lines and all sorts of things in here. Uh, it follows city code, I promise. Um, no, I'm kidding, but I'd love for you guys to come and just hang out and do that and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus next week. Friends, pray with me and then we'll do communion. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for these wonderful friends. God, thank you for the truth and power of the cross. And God, I pray that all of us, as we seek to know more about you and your word, God, and to take your claim seriously, that the the way that your blood would land on us would not be as those who seek to silence you. But God, we would with humble hearts say, 
Let His blood be on me and my children to cover us and forgive us of all sin. God, bring your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to who you are. And God, help us to not be stuck in sentimental or cultural versions of Christianity. God, give us hearts of compassion for others. Would you strike away the tone of voice and the way of speaking that just has this element of, doesn't everybody know this? God, get rid of that out of our hearts. Would you make us missionaries to others? Would you help us to stand in others' shoes and to understand that this is offensive? And God, even if we've been Christians for 20 years, if we think about it, you're still offending us. God, there's still times you come in my life when I'm working through some of my kids or my marriage or my church and I can feel your spirit saying, you need to change, Ryan, and that offends me. But Jesus, if I want to follow you, you say I have to deny myself and pick up my cross, which means I'm always working on executing things in me that aren't supposed to be there. Even when I think with everything in me, they're supposed to be there. God, give us eyes to see your word, to understand you in love and compassion and understanding for each other. God, God make us a light, uh, a city on a hill here at the seed, God, to love people who you are seeking. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, take your communion out. And if you've not done this before or joined us, you can open the clear flap on top and get your wafer. In the Bible, there's something called the Last Supper. It's right before Jesus dies. He breaks some bread and lifts up some wine. And he says, eat of my body and drink of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. If you're a believer this morning, you say, I believe in Jesus and I need him like I need my next meal. Let's eat of his body together. Open your juice, which represents the blood of Jesus Christ poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And just listen as we do this. You can find a lot of stories in the Bible of a lot of messed up people in which Jesus said, you are forgiven. And maybe this morning, that sounds too good to be true to you. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know if it's that simple. Well, I'm here to tell you, it is that simple. And if you believe in Jesus, the God of heaven and earth holds nothing against you and you're invited into his family. Drink with me. Let's sing like we mean it. Prepare ourselves for Easter, because next week we're going to have to be hoarse, singing loud enough to be hoarse together. Love you guys. Thanks, brother. Oh, sorry. Church family, thinking about the crucifixion, thinking about what our Savior is going to be enduring on Good Friday throughout this week. Uh, at least I will be. Um, that's heavy. That's a lot. And luckily we have next Sunday, knowing what happens historically next Sunday, Easter, his resurrection. We can, we can sing. We can relish in the victory of the cross. Uh, we, can, we can enjoy one day heaven. No more tears, no more sadness, and what a joy that will be. Until then, we got to fight together, and it's going to stink sometimes, a lot of times, um, but it'll be okay. We'll, we'll sing until we're hoarse, and it'll be a good time because it's for our God. It's for Jesus, uh, who can overcome sin and death for us, which that's huge. So if you believe that with us this morning, will you please join us? and pray our assurance this morning. In the person of Jesus Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Lord, for the sake of your great name, for the sake of your eternal glory, forgive our sins, for they are too numerous to count. Thank you for being so rich in wonderful mercy. Church family, you can stand with us if you'd like.
again, we're going to sing in the victory of the cross this morning. God surrounding me and casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. The voice that calms the storming seas is calling me by name, and I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross, and resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise the promise of new life cause I am yours forever and Jesus you are mine oh Jesus you are mine yeah oh Jesus you are mine When I have forgotten too many times the fullness of your grace, yes, I remember Calvary. And when you took my place, I'm singing in the victory. The victory of the cross and resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise, the promise of a new life. Cause I am yours forever. And Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. heart to sing in all. There is no one like you, God. Love immeasurable and strong. There is no one like you, God. So lead this heart to sing
the cross and resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life, because I am yours forever. And Jesus, you are mine, and I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross, and resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. And I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life, because I am yours forever. And Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. The season of Easter where we celebrate the not just the death of Christ, but more importantly, what we'll talk about next week, but his resurrection, him coming to life again is what gives us that promise that we can have new life as well. It was the, the death on the cross, the bl blood that was shed that paid our ransom, that paid our debt on the cross. Uh, but it was more important that he rose to death because then he put to death, death. And that though we may die our, a physical death, we will be with him forever. We do not have to be spiritually dead anymore. And whether this is news for you the first time where it's starting to, uh, you know, tug on your heartstrings of, you know, I've never taken this step. I've really never understood this before. Or if you've been walking with Christ for some time and we go through seasons, as the song said, where we have forgotten the fullness of his grace, where we wander, where we, we realize we are far from God because we have become far from God. I ask you to take Take a moment this week, even just find, pull Evan Ryan aside after church. We can find a time to meet with you, talk with you, pray with you. We'd love to walk through whatever season of life that you're in. As we've said before in this church, it's, you know, Christ allows you to come as you are, but you're not expected to stay there. Um, if you are going to follow in Christ, there is change. Um, one, there's change that can happen. If you're in a space where you think, I can't be any different, that's completely untrue. Um, through Christ, there is change that's possible. And if you are following Christ, there is change that is to be expected, not for you to do on your own, but for the Christ to do through you. So talk with Evan, talk with myself or Ryan. We'd be glad to, knowing it's a little bit crazy after church, even to say, hey, can we find a time for us to meet this week or something? We'd be glad um, to sit down with you, talk with you, walk with you through this. Um, and so, yeah, that's all I'll say with that. So let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you for... I thank you for the cross. As cliche as that sounds, Father, I really do. It is a reminder that I don't have to pay my own debt. I don't have to do any work to be forgiven. Um, I can't do any work to, to cover my sin. Um, Father, I thank you that you truly do allow us to come as we are, that you sent Christ to be our high priest, to suffer and to die and to live as a human, to understand and sympathize with us as we are tempted. But as he lived without sin, he is our perfect sacrifice. He paid the full price on the cross. Not that we can live and worship a, a cultural Jesus or a political Jesus, but he actually, he calls us to be more and to live our life for Christ, to live the life that Christ lived and to be set apart from this world. And he gives us the strength to do that. And I thank you that we, we are called to join you in your mission in this world. And you give us the strength and you equip us to do all that you ask us to do if we are willing. Father, I pray in this season of Easter that we don't just get caught up in, in the cultural celebration um, that comes with it. Um, thank you for the opportunities to celebrate with family and friends and all of that. But Father, I pray that we slow down for a moment. I really feel the weight of what your son went through, but also 
to fully rejoice in the redemption that we can have and that we do have in Christ. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed, church.